Welcome to another episode of the Fashion Masters Podcast. My name is Quinn Castellane. I am the VP of Block Therapy, and we have Deanna Hanson, the founder of Block Therapy. And today we're talking about a really important subject that happens to pretty well everyone, but more specifically in our community because we focus so much on healing. And the title of this, how about you say the title of this podcast? Yeah, the title is You're Not Going Backwards, You're Healing. And I love that because that the the journey to healing is in a linear line. We're going to have some obstacles. We're going to be doing some ups and downs, and that's part of it. Nothing in nature is a perfect linear structure. There's always these wave spirals, ups and downs, and that's just how we are. But it's a really important subject for people to understand whether they're doing block therapy, whether they're doing a different mode of fascia decompression or a therapy where we are opening up the body to give it the opportunity to actually heal and what these healing opportunities or a healing crisis may present within itself. So Deanna, let's chat a bit about what is a healing crisis or a healing opportunity and why do they happen? So our fascia is like a sponge. Over our lifetime, we're absorbing everything from the toxins in the air, the food, the water that we drink, even the negative emotions from other people, the like all the radiation from your phones and computers. I mean, like we are literally plummeted with stuff that we're absorbing. So the body, again, has this beautiful opportunity to heal, but the body has to be working properly in order to move those toxins efficiently out. And really the breath is the most efficient way to move toxins out of the body. And we all know that the majority of people aren't accessing their proper diaphragmatic breath. So what's going on is layer after layer after layer, these toxins are getting built up in the spaces. They're sticking to the fascia, the netting, and they're getting cloggy or they're, they're clogging our systems. And mm -hmm. as we get older, they move deeper, deeper, deeper into the body. So all of the unprocessed stuff is essentially what we're jarring when we start mm. doing block therapy or any other modality when we're putting positive energy into the body. So what's very common that we see is when people start blocking, and I mean, there's always exceptions to the rule, but what's very common is when people start blocking, they start to feel really good because now we're putting that positive energy in, they're starting to access their breath, they're starting to move out some of those toxins, pull more oxygen in, but then we get to those deeper, deeper layers. So we, as you mentioned already, it's not a linear line. So initially often people feel, oh, I'm starting to feel really good. And then you can feel this crashing because suddenly the body actually has enough energy to push the old to the surface mm. so it can leave. It takes energy to heal. And if, as soon as we start turning on the breath, the proper breath, we actually start increasing the energy potential in our body. So then the body jumps into this healing process. And it is during these moments when we're having these healing crises that the body's actually doing the best version of healing because it's pushing out what is no longer serving us to create more space for more oxygen and more good stuff. And then we go layer after layer after layer. So mm. the thing is, I mean, I'm what, 24 years into this journey. And I mean, I've had multiple healing crises. I continue to have them. And that's what we want because there are layers of garbage. And we're still being exposed to yes. a ridiculous amount of toxins on a daily basis. Remember that discussion we did, um, forget the name, unfortunately, but she mentioned how many new toxins. 144,000 compared to, I think it was the 50s. Yeah. So new toxins or yeah. new some sort of negative debris, we'll call it, I don't know, yeah. in, in the air alone that they were testing that we are inhaling on a daily basis. And I'm sure that is dependent on where you live exactly. Like if you're in a more densely populated area, we could be affected differently than if you were to live in the suburbs, for example, or the wilderness. The wilderness, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But regardless, that's just one thing. Then it's the food we eat. Then it's what kind of things are we putting on our body? What kind of sprays are we using? Um, like the list just goes on. But I love how you said that it's unprocessed stuff that gets stuck in our body because our body's a magnificent healing machine. But when we pummel it with so much garbage, 
you can't process it that quickly. Right. And especially if a your breath isn't engaged, you're not moving properly, you're not eating the proper like if you're not intentionally and actively detoxifying your body w- from whatever method that you're doing, it's only going to keep getting stored and stuck in your system. So what we're doing, we're kind of we're kind of jarring the process a little bit. We're jar- jarring the fascia to open up more space to lift these toxins and um, uh, yeah, toxins primarily to the surface so that our body has to start dealing with that to rid it from our body. And through that process, if we can't exhale it out quick enough or rid it through any form of waste, then it may present itself in many different forms. And a really common one can be starting off with a little bit of a runny nose, but then it can go uh, surface to skin rashes. And then there's a whole other, there's so many of them. And I know you're going to be uh, telling us some of your pretty wild healing crises that you've experienced. I've experienced some as well. Our community has experienced it, but always when you're on the other side, there's a massive benefit even to prior to when you had that healing crisis. There's always going to be a benefit, but in that moment, it can just feel a little annoying or it might feel that you are taking a step back, but you're actually doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing. And just to give um, our listeners a little more sort of a visual of what's going on, if you had a really big closet just stuffed with stuff, and then let's say like right in the corner in the deepest recess of the closet, like you had um, a hockey bag that, you know, you'd left like old hockey clothes in. And there's mold growing in there. There's mold growing in there. So like you go in and you open this door and it's like, whoa, like something bad is in here and you start cleaning it out. And as you start cleaning it out, the room that you're putting all the stuff into becomes messier. Yeah. But you're getting deeper and you start moving more stuff out. So it's it's this crazy process, right? And I loved it because um, I used to work years ago with a gentleman named Stephen Horn. And he gave such a great analogy as to what we really need to do to be healthy. He said, if you had a garage filled with garbage and you were attracting cockroaches and rats and rodents and whatever you know one approach is to go and kill them the other approach is to take out the garbage Mm. but as we take out the garbage you know the garbage has to be taken out one's kind of a band-aid solution one's getting to the root cause yeah exactly yeah so i mean we've seen so many phenomenal i mean i've dealt with so many people through phenomenal healing crises and yes once on the other side like you're you're definitely in in this better space i remember there was one of our community members who started blocking and for quite a while Um, like, you know, weeks, she had a psoriasis breakout and it was all over her face and her hands. And I mean, they looked cracked and red and almost like that elephant skin. I remember this. Yeah. And it was, it was fascinating to see. But then as soon as she got through it, I mean, her eyes were bigger. Everything was more open. Her skin was refreshed and renewed. Like it was wild. Mm. And I personally, I mean, can attest to that whole sense of what's going on because I am fingers crossed, (laughs) finally coming to the end of my nine month healing crisis that I've been going through with my eyes. Nine months. It started last February when I was in Mexico and it started Mm -hmm. with my right eye. It looked just like a little bit of a red irritation. The skin looked like a little wrinkly. And, you know, then I'm starting to, I beat myself up all the time with my hands and and whatever. Yeah, you go, you go to town on yourself. Like you really, if you're if you're invested in a certain area of your body, I remember your hip and now it's your eyes, like you don't stop. There's no quit. No, there is no stop until it's out because I don't want to prolong it. And I mean, everybody has to figure what is the pace that you're comfortable going through. But I mean, I I recognize what it is. And I mean, there's no fear. It's just uncomfortable. And too, like when you're in front of a camera all the time and it's your eyes, I can't hide it with a shirt or, you know, something because like here it is right in everybody's face. But it was wild because I start working on it and you know, it started out as this little irritation, this little red area. And then before I knew it, like, you know, weeks, months in, now it's like this whole eye. And it was like really wrinkly and red. And again, like if I touched it, I could hardly even sense the skin. It had that leathery feel. And then suddenly I was so excited because I'm like, oh my gosh, it's starting to clear up like months later. And then boom, and it starts on my left eye. But what was and, and so, I mean, you can still kind of see it, but I'm almost there now. Like it's, it's been quite the journey, but was, what was amazing was now I'm thinking back to what this probably started with. And 
years ago, you'll remember we were working with um, somebody that was pretty toxic to us and our company. And as a result of that, I landed in bed with a fever for eight days and I don't you know, go to hospitals and do doctor stuff. So I had a fever like for eight days and I was, this was like really severe for the listeners. Yeah, this I, was no, like you have a fever. You yeah. were you, I was, at your worst. Yeah. Sure. I've never been that sick in my life. And prior to that, what was wild was when I was visiting this person, I was actually blocking the left side of my neck. And in the moment I felt this wild shooting pain right into the corner of my left eye here. And in that, so I, I take my hand there and then suddenly a bump developed. Like it felt like a little pee. And I worked and worked and worked on it. Like, go away, go away. But I couldn't get it to go away anywhere. So anyways, that all happened around the same time. Then I get really, really sick. And as a result of that fever, I remember I was looking outside and it was a January day and I was looking at the white outside. So everything was really bright and my electrolytes were so imbalanced because I hadn't eaten for eight days. I'd been sweating like crazy. And suddenly it was like somebody was turning the lights down. Like hmm. the white suddenly becomes this yellowy and I'm like, whoa. So anyway, um, you know, I healed and, and all was well, but my vision was affected. And my vi like prior to that moment, I had exceptional vision. And from that moment going forward, my vision was not as clear, especially my left eye. It wasn't as good. So what I found fascinating was as I've been going through this left eye journey, that bump is now gone. Mm. So all of this stuff coming out through my eyes, mm. it's gone. And now that left eye, the vision is almost like it was prior to mm. when this whole thing started. Wow. So, and that was eight or nine years ago, this began. So, I mean- That was a very long time ago. I think about, well, and what's also been wild is the tissue has been like peeling off, like sloughing away. So I think about- had this stayed inside my head, you know, my mom died of a brain tumor. Perhaps that could have been my fate. Like, who knows what could have happened? But, mm. you know, stuff's been leaving. So super grateful, you know, not, again, irritated because like it was itchy and dry and, and all those things. But again, understanding what's going on, so grateful for that, especially now that I'm almost on the other side. <laughs> yeah, no, no kidding. That's crazy. So so let, let's take a step back to what are some of the, and we did briefly touch on this, but what are some of the common healing crises that our blockers, our community experiences? Like what, what's some of the main things that you would see within a month or three months of blocking? I, one of the first things is change in pain. And it's interesting because um, when we start shifting our alignment what's happening is we're now shifting our entire body back to a different space. So now the joints are articulating with tissue that they have not been communicating with. And the first thing that they're going to feel is pain. So, you know, if you'd had a, a, a bad ankle and then you start rebuilding that ankle as you're shifting, you know, now maybe your SI joint or maybe your hip or your knee or your shoulder, like any, anything might start to hurt. So change in pain, that's a sign that you're moving in a positive direction. So I always say it's not like in, in those initial moments, we don't need to look at what's improving. We just need to look at change because the body's going through change. And that's what has to happen. If we don't change anything, we're going to keep changing. But, you know, gravity is going to be the driver. So change in pain is a big one. Um, another one, as you mentioned, um, mucus production, because that's the body pulling stuff out. So whether it's coming out through the nose, maybe your eyes are leaking or burning. Maybe you have diarrhea, um, skin rash, all of these things is your body pushing stuff up to the surface. Coughing and sneezing. I mean, yes, it's a pain to cough, but I mean, if you think about the strength, mm. like if you've ever had a really wicked cough where you're coughing all day, that's like doing, you know, a thousand sit-ups. <laughs> like really, like you're you're moving this stuff so yeah. forcefully out of your body, but that's your body using the energy that you have to push out the stuff. Same as sneezing. Deep, deep within the lungs. Huge. Um, emotional releases, because again, the emotion, those, those negative frequencies, they get trapped and locked in. So again, you might feel like, wow, like, why do I just feel so agitated today? Or like, why, why do I just want to ball my eyes out all day long? And I haven't actually had any impulse to make me sad. Mm. But again, now these things are coming to the surface. It can be memories surfacing. It can be nightmares coming to the surface because once you jar the body, those memories connected to the emotion, connected to the Aries also get brought up. 100%. So 
Um, I used to, when in my 20s, when I was a nightmare myself, I mean, I used to have frequent nightmares, like three, four times a week, I'd have awful nightmares. And now I might have a nightmare, you know, once every six, eight months, once a year. And when I do, I also recognize, okay, like I've moved deeper and I'm pulling up some old mm -hmm. stagnant, you know, stuff circling through my body. Or you just watch a really spooky movie. Well, that could be too. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. And, and, you know, even just changing your perspective of life, which is a, which is a positive thing, right? Like yeah. suddenly something that, you know, you used to believe suddenly something changes for yeah. you and you, yeah. you have a whole different perspective on what life should be. So these are all examples of what can happen. And we want to embrace and give our bodies those times to heal because your body is actually in that healing moment. That's the most important part. And then you get it out of your body and then you go on that upswing and then you're like, oh my gosh, I'm feeling really, really, really good. And then boom, you get to another deeper layer and your body has to go through that same process. And it's really important to know that everybody's so different with this because I know people that have been blocking for a really long time and some people don't really experience much of a healing crisis. And this is where I think it's really dependent person to person on how efficient they are at dealing with all of this garbage they're unlocking in their body. So the more efficient as a machine that you are, the more efficient you are at ridding all this garbage from your body and then resulting in less of a either physical or emotional crisis that you're going through just because your system's now at a better level. And that's probably interesting too, because as you start doing this work, your system's improving. So your healing crises could be more intense in the moment because you're releasing deeper stuff, but a quicker turnover time because your body is now more efficient at detoxifying from what you opened your your body to. Yeah. And I also think it, it um, like when do traumas or incidences occur? So just as an example, like maybe um, you worked in an area like a hairdresser's, for example, or dry cleaners, you know, they're pulling these chemicals into their body every single day. So if you're surrounded by that kind of scenario, that's one thing. What age did you have something happen? I mean, I can talk about my hip. I mean, I had six or seven years, and I think I, I have to go through these things to really understand them on a yeah, deep level. Yeah. But for six or seven years, I was dealing with my left hip pain, and I knew it the second it happened. So it was interesting because when I was seven years old, I had a really, really bad accident on my pubic bone. I was, you know, cycling on one of these um, stationary bikes. And at the time, like it had a really small radius and it had one of those metal ball bearings. So I wanted to see how fast I could go. And my mom actually didn't want me doing this. So, you know, now I'm hiding it and I get on the bike and I'm cycling as quickly as I can and my foot slips. And then I fall forward and I land on that metal ball thing oh, right on oh, my feet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I couldn't tell her that I did it. So, and I was in horrendous pain. So I, I did my best to hide it. So now I'm compensating how I'm walking. So then this was about, I don't know, 10 years ago. I remember the moment because I got out of my car and suddenly I was like, oh, that's a weird feeling in my hip. Mm -hmm. The next day though, my issues with constipation stopped. And I always believed that my issues with constipation weren't gut related. It always felt like something was in the way. So now my hip shifts for whatever reason. I mean, maybe it was just mm -hmm. time, right? I've been blocking and all that stuff. I get out of the car, here's the pain, but my constipation, and I mean, for those of us that have constipation, I truly believe that's one of the worst feelings in the world because you're dealing with yesterday's stuff and it's hard to be present when you're backed up like that. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, wow, like beautiful gift, but holy smokes, here's my pain. And I, you know, when we're doing our videos, I'm always sitting, you know, cross-legged. And I mean, sometimes for hours we would be filming doing that and it was always mm -hmm. easy. And then suddenly there was years where I was very uncomfortable because it was just so painful. But then it finally subsided on the left side. And I'm like, I bet you that right hip's going to have to go through something yeah, the same. Yeah. And sure enough, then I think I had about two years of my right hip. But again, because I understood it and I knew what I needed to do. And I also recognized I had a lot of rebuilding to do in there because that was a really significant injury that I had that I grew with. Unlike if it happened when I was fully grown, now I'm growing with this compensation mm -hmm. and now I'm having to actually rebuild all that space that didn't actually develop properly. So I was prepared for the length of time and yeah, it wasn't fun, but again, I wasn't afraid of it and I knew that eventually it will be fine and I'm fine now with that. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, that's that's another crazy story. And I remember I might have mentioned this on another episode, but going back to the trauma component, uh, remember there's this influencer I was chatting with on Instagram and um, we were kind of going back and forth about trauma and healings and whatnot. And he does like legit trauma, emotional healing ceremonies or sessions with individuals or big groups of people. It's fascinating to see. And I was telling him a little bit about our work and block therapy and that we um, did a trauma release summit and that we work in the fashion. He's like, that makes total sense because trauma is stored in the fascia. And as soon as like he said that, it just kind of like rang true. It's like, wow. Okay. More like validation that, okay, more people than just us or a select group of people believe that like it really is trapped in the body, in the fascia, and we have to physically release it too. There's many different ways to help release trauma, but we are physical beings. We are physical. So we have to do something physical. Yes. If you combine that with something intentional, uh, with an emotional release, with what, whatever the case is, that's only going to expedite the process. But I think first and foremost, we're physical and we need to address the body. And the thing too, that, you know, I think just makes this system so accessible to people is because those adhesions gripping onto bone, if we don't release it from the bone, we're only releasing some of those layers. And I remember um, one of the people that we were working with had such a great response when they added it to TRE. Because sometimes when you start agitating the body and there's a lot of emotional trauma stored in the cells, it can be overwhelming. Yeah. But because we address the calves and the feet, the forearms and the hands, we're, we're opening up those limbs in that physical way. Now that energy can get dispersed efficiently out of the body. So we still have to navigate our own pace with this because yeah, sometimes if you do have a lot of fear trapped in you, it can be overwhelming. But the nice thing to know is like you can decide, okay, I'm only going to do this much today. And and yeah. sometimes you got to test the waters a little bit and you might have a little bit of a flare back and say, okay, that was too much, too far to go, but we all have to figure it out for ourselves. But the nice thing is, is because we do address the entire body and we open up the limbs, then once that energy is brought to the surface, it can like move through the channels really efficiently. And then we can get to that healing that we're looking for. A hundred percent. And even like at a retreat, um, like it, that's, that's a lot of work we're doing mm. in three days. Yes. It was three hours of blocking, intense blocking in the morning. And then there is either another two hour intense session or the fitness combined with blocking. It's like, it's a lot yeah. on the body. Then we had our evening like meditation. There is, that's still all intentional with helping to release and et cetera. But I remember there was a lady that was, I was kind of walking around and assessing, seeing how everybody's doing. And then we were working in the low back and she was like, this is a really sensitive area for me. And I'm like, Hey, go at your own pace. You can use like some pillows or this to kind of hold you up to prevent you from getting so deep all at once. And then maybe like 20 minutes later or so she had a big emotional release. And that's so amazing that it happened. But in the moment, it's obviously a little uncomfortable and there could be pain following that, but it's amazing how much that can get stored and trapped in the body. But when you do an intensive retreat or workshop, you're getting deep fast. And then your body's having to work even harder to push all of this stuff that you brought to the surface. And that's where really profound healing can happen and can occur is when you are intentional, you're dedicated three days to a retreat of block therapy. Like, yeah. I'm surprised more people actually haven't gone through a healing crisis right then and there. Maybe people have after, but again, they could be minor. They can be little shifts. They could be shifts in really anything. But that was really cool because she was doing so much better after she got over that release. Yeah. And and I think part of the reason that um, we had such a, because yes, I mean, we, we never know what's going to come up and we have a room full of people that we don't actually personally know from all ages, all conditions. And, and there was only the one. And I, I do believe it was largely because of that meditation component we did as well, mm -hmm. because we really brought people in the evenings through a, a really beautiful, calming breathing process. Yeah. Um, so again, just like when you, when you bring it up to the surface, you want to make sure that you understand that breathing part, because that's the way 
to move it out. And I, I love how you mentioned like um, when when that gentleman you were talking to, the validation piece, that was how I felt when they came out with that study in 2014 about weight loss with excellence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I mean, you know, I'd always been talking about how like it's the, the rules of weight loss, right? And and it's, it's about breath. So, um, but it's more than weight loss. It's the detoxification. It's the Big time. moving the negative emotion out. And one of the things that I've really seen when people are having a lot of emotional releases is that they're very um, pulled in through here and they've got that very rounded upper back yeah. because you're storing, like you've mm -hmm. literally locked away your ability to process. And right in your solar plexus too is yeah. where that collapses. Yeah, and that third chakra area is, is, you know, feeling empowered in your own life. And then, I mean, how many of us, all of us are brokenhearted at some time or another in life or just in life in general, right? So then we guard and we pull in and we store as opposed to saying, okay, I've been inflicted with some kind of negativity. I'm going to keep what serves me and I'm going to let go of the rest. We, yeah. we don't tend to let go very easily yeah. um, because we haven't been trained how or why we need to breathe. And again, it's that pain, fear, and stress that reactively cause us to hold the breath. So if we don't release that, like that dare surviving an attack who shakes, mm -hmm. you know, then it stays locked in. And then we pattern our thinking around that event as well. Because Big time. They that kind of locks together. it in place, hey? It does. Yeah. So interesting. Uh, but that that's good that you mentioned about the deer shaking, because that's such a perfect example that it can do it right then and there. So they innately know that if they are being chased by a predator... But and they survive, they go through like an intensive shaking process, which is them kind of like doing the TRE trauma release exercises to shake this uh, out of the body. So, yeah, I guess every time we're traumatized, we just got to do some intensive shaking or something. Well, it just reminds me of the funniest story. I was with your mom in Mexico, and this just it was hilarious. So, you know, our flight was leaving at midnight and it's noon when we have to be out of our rooms. So now we have the whole afternoon to sit around the pool and basically wait. So I'm sitting under an umbrella. Your mom is beside me on a lounge chair and I'm reading a book. And the first thing that happens is I see out of the corner of my eye, it looks like a snake because all I see is the tail of this iguana and it was big and it was walking under my chair. And I let out this really loud scream and your mom likes to punch me, right? So I let out this scream, but in the moment I let it out because I screamed. Like had yeah. I just like, I'm... <gasps> I heard it was like a horrifying scream. Okay, well, that was the one yet. There's an, oh, so, oh. so then we're, we're laughing about it after I, so yeah, like that's the thing. If I didn't scream, I'm holding it in yeah. that fear. So anyways, we, we follow the iguana and I see it walking up the tree. So I'm like, oh, this thing is huge. And I'm watching it walk up the tree. And then I get a little disinterested. So I go back to my chair and I go back to my book. And it was hilarious because as I'm reading, I think to myself, wait a sec, this iguana is like right over top of me. And as soon as I thought that, it lands on the top of the umbrella right over me. And I let out like the horror movie of all horror movie screams every, and this was a massive pool and everybody like, you know, is, is, is looking. looking. Your mom punches me again. She's like, what? and I left. Like, then I'm thinking, thank God for the umbrella because had it landed on my head, yeah, yeah, I'm not really sure what would have happened to me, but the scream. So, but then I couldn't stop laughing. Because now here's all this energy that I'm releasing, yeah, right? Yeah. And and so like it's it's fascinating how our bodies are wired. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. A hundred percent. Well, and and it's interesting how there's again so many different forms of healing crises and healing opportunities that we can go through. And we were chatting about this br briefly before, but so I would pro I don't want to say that I was like addicted to caffeine, but I was definitely highly dependent on it. And that stemmed from a young age. And then when I got into bodybuilding and I worked at a supplement store, you get all these free pre-workouts and all these new things you want to try. Like they, they really encourage you to try them so you understand what they are so that you can sell them essentially. Mm -hmm. So I would just get like an infinite amount of these pre-workouts. So I was taking so much plus coffee, plus this, plus that. And then... I slowed down eventually. I had to cut out pre-workout because that one time I got very, very sick from it. Actually, that was a really scary moment. But long story short, I remember I was, I took 
three different pre-workouts and I mix them together. The stupidest idea you could do is probably like well over like it was probably close to like 500 milligrams of caffeine, which oh is gosh. like like if you have 200, you are like almost shaking. Like it's it's a ton. Plus synephrine, which is a stimulant. Who knows what other stimulants are are it's like in you there? Said 20 espresso shots. Oh, <laughs> yeah. But the thing is, it's not just caffeine. It's right. also different stimulants that wire you in a different way. And I remember I was trying to do like, I felt awful. I was trying to do deadlifts, couldn't do it. Then I tried doing a chin up, then my arms just cut out. Then I tried doing a cable row. And then I was just like, something's not right. And then I was like getting really lightheaded, almost felt like there was like black flashes happening. So I get home, I walk in the door, my mom's immediate, cause I was probably 20 at the time. My mom's like, what did you do? And I'm like, I don't know, but like, this isn't good. This isn't good. I took way too much pre-workout. Like. Like, I can't breathe. My heart's all messed up. Like, I don't know what's going on. So we almost went to the emergency, but I remember just downing like six glasses of water to try to flush it out of my body. It was like the scariest moment, like seriously scary moment. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. my heart could have just like gone on overdrive. Right. Just cut out. Like, I don't, I don't know. So then after that moment, I'm like done with supplements. So I cut out supplements for a very, very, very long time. Well, all like bodybuilding supplements or whatever cut them out completely. I take very, very intentional, specific health supplements now. But anyways, so as you can imagine, I had a high tolerance to caffeine and I built all this up in my system, never slowed down coffee. You and I, when, when we first started working together, like we love coffee. Yeah. We would wake up, have a pot of coffee in the afternoon, have another pot of coffee, go for lunch, coffee, like coffee, coffee, coffee. And then I started doing all this research and I remember I, um, I purchased this like marketing course and this guy was all about like no caffeine, strict diet, this and that. And, and it just got me to this whole new level of, okay, I'm going into like my crazy monk mode or military mode. I'm being super strict. And he's like, don't do caffeine. It does this, 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 all these bad things. So I go into this rabbit hole, realize, okay, maybe caffeine's not good. Um, especially high amounts. And then next day, cut it out. And then I'm, I remember I was in like some meetings and I'm like, man, my brain's fought. Like I can hardly like pay attention to what's going on. I can hardly communicate and articulate anything. Then the next day started getting like really headachy, but it was like day three. I just got smoked by the full blown aches and pains, remember, yeah. migraine headache, couldn't move, couldn't get out of bed for like five days. I was stuck in bed and I just had to like cancel all of my meetings maybe it wasn't five but it was for sure like no three it days. was a long time i think you were you were out for a good six or seven days in total from the beginning of when you weren't good like it was a week so i'm like wow like we haven't been working for a week <laughs> <laughs> i know i'm like trying to be on my laptop getting some work done in bed and i'm just like can't fo like no. can't do it and i'm like i'm not drinking caffeine like it was like when i cut it out cold turkey i was not going back and um yeah that was the craziest thing because i didn't think caffeine withdrawals could be that intense and that's your body going through a detoxification through a massive healing crisis so massive sweating aches and pains fever headaches migraines like it was awful yeah and then after that my energy there was never a spike and crash it was just always this solid energy my anxiety was like significantly lower yeah. i felt really really good I do drink caffeine now. It sounds bad. It's like, oh, well, now I'm back on it. <laughs> but regulate, like, no, you're not drinking very coffee. regulated. Yeah. I, I have a cup of coffee a day. Yeah. And sure, there's times where I might need a little extra kick if we're really busy with things. And I'm like, okay, I need this. But other than that, I, I like going through times where I can detoxify from caffeine. Mm -hmm. I just know that it's going to be tough. It won't be as bad as that first time. It'll never be as bad as no, that. No. But again, your adrenal glands are starting to repair. Every Everything's starting to repair. And yeah, so anyways, a healing crisis from block, whether it's with block therapy or you cut something bad out of your body, um, it's all good. Even just changing your diet can create a healing crisis. I mean, massive. Anything. Yeah. Massive. Suddenly you're just crisis. drinking enough water and, and your body again has the energy to, you know, mobilize the deeper stuff. So I think it's important that people who are going through a healing crisis, that there, there are things that they can do to help assist with the process. So obviously continuing, continuing to block 
is a benefit. Don't have to go crazy on it, but making sure that your breath is good. S prioritize sleep, I would say. Yeah, really prioritize sleep. Try not to have caffeine too late in the day so that you can have a really restful sleep. And then start finding certain foods or whatever that you're taking or supplements to help to detoxify your body. And, and this is an- magnesium is great. Like whether you're taking it um, like in the proper way internally or having the Epsom salt baths, you know, like I, I love the yeah. baths because like it, you know, it draws through the skin, the stuff, mm -hmm. and you can be in a nice calming bath with the salt getting, um, we just, uh, the hydration is key though, because especially yeah. when you're detoxifying, you want to be able to, so you know. getting the electrolytes in yeah. are really important too. Um, again, I- I'm a big believer on a bunch of fruits and vegetables, organic if you can. Anyways, we don't have to get into the the whole shebang because I could talk forever about uh, foods and supplements, but that's where I think people need to do a little research on their end when it comes down to what should I be doing to detoxify my body? We've talked about the medical medium stuff. I like using it as a tool yep. for certain times in my life. There's so many great things out there. There's so many, and that's the thing I'm learning because I could see find Sonics, this new guy. like. Infrared totally saunas, infrared saunas are huge like there's there's a million things that you can do but find what makes sense for you again the biggest thing is yes i would say proper breathing hydration with electrolytes and sleep and sleep yeah. those like prioritize that and your body will do good and then try to cut out some of the garbage yeah whether that's if you are uh alcohol drinker try cutting that out for the time period if you're having a lot of gluten or dairy as an example not saying cut that out but for me that's something that i would do right away because the liver's already stressed i mean even if you are living a healthy lifestyle again like we're we're being flogged by mm. toxins so yep. the liver's really you know already just having to overwork yeah and when we're going through this it's working that much harder so yeah by throwing more garbage in your body and it's funny too because often when people feel unwell they choose to eat less healthy food it's just funny how that things. works. Yeah. Do you know, that's even something that um, I think it was my grandma, like my dad's mom uh, said once upon a time, like, whenever you're sick, just eat whatever you want. Yeah. Just eat whatever you're craving kind of thing. And then I remember. You'll feel better by yeah, like, yeah, you know, yeah. giving yourself that. <laughs> and I remember I'm at, I'm at home. Well, I think it's like the idea is because like, okay, you're not eating. So just eat something that you can get down. But I remember this one time I was really sick at home. I was young, probably like 16 or something, 18, I don't know. And then um, my dad's like, hey, want me to pick you up anything? And I'm like, yeah, I want chicken wings. <laughs> <laughs> so I just showered down. I think I only had like three of them, but it's like, uh, if I knew the stuff that I know now back then, it'd be a lot different. Um, but anyways, I think that's really important is find things that will assist you on your healing um, opportunity and your healing journey. And, and don't be afraid because when you get, fearful your breath becomes compromised and the process gets slower and you know what that means community when you're feeling fearful yeah reach out to the community absolutely share share your story whether and if it's a really personal story then of course you can reach out to our support yeah uh, which is i deal private. with all the time privately you know yeah. that don't want to share their stuff but in our trauma summit i can't remember um if it was Catherine, i believe um one of the speakers that we had that was her whole thing. We heal with community. Right. Yes. Because, I remember that. Again, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, like if, if you've experienced this and, and you're talking with other people that have also experienced the same thing, you, you feel understood and the nature of feeling understood, there's love in that. There's a higher frequency in that because now you're not, I'm not the only one that's been made to feel shameful and dirty and guilty and like whatever those emotions are that, you know, yeah. can surround us with things that are, are not pleasant. So um, understanding that, no, you're not alone. That's a huge piece. That's great. And, and, that. and that's, that's so cool because we can circle that right back to their, to the retreat. So many people are saying after day one, day two, well, after every day, I guess that they're like, oh my God, like I can get so much deeper. I'm seeing so many like quicker results when I'm like here with you guys and doing this and in this room. And it's like, that's the community you're with the community, you can heal that much faster. You can get that much deeper. You know, we're all in it together. Yeah. That's what's so important about in-person retreats. Like yeah. you, we're physical beings, we're social beings. We need to be social. Even though you and I are 
you're maybe a little bit more introverted than I am. I'm I'm more introverted than what people would probably think. Me too. Um, but there's something very special and magical about being with people who have an intention together in a room for three days to simply be pain seekers. <laughs> and what was so funny was there were two women there that I had gone to school with and they're a few years younger than me. And so there was a number of people in that retreat that were over 60, 65 years old. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, a lot of like, I'd say a third of them were. So here's these two, you know, women in their late forties and they're looking at these older women just going to town on the block, doing your, doing your exercises and they're not holding back. And they're like, well, if they can do it, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's it, right? Like if you're on your own and you're thinking, oh, it hurts too much, maybe not. But then you see other people and, and you're thinking, I should be able to do it if somebody 20 years older than me. A hundred percent. Um, there is something super powerful in that. And they pushed it. It was good. <laughs> this is so slightly off topic, but just funny. That's what Arnold Schwarzenegger would always go to a public gym. He could build any gym he wanted to, but he would always go to a public gym because he knew that girls were going to be there looking at him and that was his motivation. Well, there you go. You know, whatever works for you. Hey, I've been there. Yeah, I'm sure you have. <laughs> <laughs> but but it's amazing how that works. And you're like, okay, I can do a little bit more. Uh, I can do a little bit more. Well, that reminds me when I used to work on you all the time and I would give you the power. Like I knew I was mm -hmm. going really deep and I'm like, Quinn, let me know if you want me to back off. And you're like, no. <laughs> well, no, I'd be like, I'd be like, I'd be like, okay, this is getting like really intense. And you're like, okay, well, like I can back off. And I'm like, okay, no, it's okay. Just keep going. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but that, that's it. You yeah. give the power to the res the recipient of yeah. whatever we're doing. And then now they know that they're in control. And that is such a cool point too, because I deal with this with clients all the time when I'm working on patients and I'm getting into a painful area and they're like, oh, that's a, that's a scary area. And I'll always say, okay, you know what? I'm just the wall now. You move into my hand. I'm not going to do anything except allow you to do what you want. And then inevitably, they're like driving into my hand almost Com harder than I would be driving my hand into their tissue. Yeah, a completely switch of perspective. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's all about perspective. There. Sure is. That's super cool. Um, but yeah, I think that's it's a pretty cool episode. Yeah. I just think it's important that people understand doing anything it's not just block th block therapy is very profound at releasing and opening up the spaces to heal this is a healing tool yeah. if you're intentional about anything when it comes down to ridding your pain managing your size and shape anything improving circulation recovery perform whatever the case is you're going to receive amazing amazing benefits from it if you stick with it and yes there's going to be times and opportunities where you will need to heal and we call that the healing crisis so uh, thank you very much for listening and tuning in. Again, if you want to learn more about block therapy, you can check out our YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, check out our videos. You can check, you can try um, many of our positions we share. We also have a lot of information on there. Our website is blocktherapy.com. There's free gifts that you can pick up and check out. And our community in Facebook, because we talked about community, that's really important. Uh, just go to Facebook, type in block therapy community, and then it's a, it's a group. Just request your access and we'll accept you in. And that's everything. So we'll see everybody next week. And thank you very much, Deanna. That was a lot of fun. Thank you very much, Quinn. And for all of you listening, most importantly, reach out if you need us. We're here. Absolutely. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.